Governance. It is the responsibility of our chamber and every member here to play a role in delivering the Tasmanian community with confidence in the governance of this state. With that in mind, Madam Deputy President, members here may recall that I and others in this place, including in fact you, Madam Deputy President, have previously called for measurable benchmarking and progress indicators to be developed and incorporated systematically within key government processes, such as the state budget. I've pre previously raised the need for such a genuine and transparent policy progress reporting mechanism to, be, to enable meaningful monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of actually the PESTRAC recommendations. I called for that last year. The challenges and opportunities facing Tasmania in this brave new post-pandemic world present us with a once in a century opportunity to redefine all aspects of our social, economic and sustainability uh, circumstances and priorities. We have opportunities to shift the levers pulled by government to address in a meaningful and long-term manner intergenerational inequalities. We have discussed some of these opportunities to some extent in the Chamber last year and earlier this year. We have stressed in those discussions how the manner of delivery of such reforms can be as important as the reforms themselves in strengthening public confidence if they are transparent, have integrity and demonstrate good governance. The post-COVID focus on redefining and rebuilding Tasmania makes it very timely for the state now as a matter of urgency to develop and commit to a rigorous set of public policy priority benchmarks and progress, perform and progress performance indicators. Such a benchmarking and progress indicator system, prioritising transparent monitoring, monitoring and reporting mechanisms, would encourage community confidence in the rationale for and the delivery of identified policy priorities and outcomes. Importantly, a systematic performance monitoring and reporting approach should break our current reliance on short-term action or spending lists in isolation from any accountability mechanism evaluating actual progress in addressing long-term entrenched challenges. Madam Deputy President, let me put that much more plainly. It's very easy for the government to do three things that give the impression of progress while in no way holding themselves to accountable to making an actual difference in solving the biggest challenges faced by our state. See if these three things sound familiar. Firstly, the government says it's investing record amounts in a particular area of policy. Sounds impressive, but it's completely meaningless in terms of actual achievement of outcomes. One dollar more than last year is a record investment. It's a meaningless statement. It is the outcomes of that investment, the outcomes that that investment is they are committing to achieve that becomes the meaningful measure of the government's success, not the claim to record investment of and by itself. A commitment to accountable outcomes is what the government must be putting on the record, not crowing about record investments. The second thing that might sound familiar, another familiar tactic, is when the government says it's adding X number of new positions to an area of public policy. Might be teachers, might be police or the like. Sounds impressive, sounds like a very good thing, but in itself, it is completely meaningless in terms of accountability to achieve actual improvement in outcomes. It's progress on achieving meaningful outcomes and improvements that the government must be held to account for in the area into which those new positions are being added. The third common sleight of hand to give the impression of progress that's often used by government is when it says it will establish a new special role or an entity to take lead responsibility for this policy area or identified issue. Those announcements sound impressive. It's a new commission. It's a very special new role with an impressive title. But in and of themselves, they are completely meaningless in terms of accountability to actual improvement of outcomes. What progress on achieving meaningful outcomes and improvements will the government be held to account for in establishing that shiny new, often impressively titled role or entity? Madam Deputy President, we could almost play bingo with this government using these three hollow tactics to appear, uh, that they use to appear effective. 
in each of those all too familiar refrains from government, what we get is a description of activity without an accompanying a commitment to achieving an outcome. Activity is so appealing, is it not? It looks and sounds impressive. It's easier to have a big list of activities to tick off and crow about than to be held to account for progress on the outcomes of those issue areas. This very familiar pattern, continuing unchecked, is why we can have a government merrily making announcements of, for example, planning to build impressive sounding numbers of social houses year after year, while across that self same period of time, we see our social housing waitlist blow out to historic levels. Ticking off a list of activity is easy. Being accountable for making change, for making progress on outcomes that we seek and prioritise as a community is all too often completely avoided by this government. Which is why I believe that the opening of a new parliament <coughs> reflecting a newly re-elected government is a timely place and opportunity to again reiterate the need for a comprehensive whole of government meaningful set of progress performance indicators which are set with community input and are independently auditable. I've been investigating, in fact, Madam Deputy President, models in place elsewhere for policy, delivery, monitoring, evaluation and accountability reporting frameworks. And I can report that in this regard, Tasmania is in fact falling well behind other jurisdictions, nationally and internationally. We were doing so even before the 2020 pandemic and definitely since. A common element of different interstate and international models is a shift to budgetary and reporting mechanisms focusing on policy outcomes rather than just financial inputs and outputs. As the model in Victoria states, my quote, good public policy and service delivery must demonstrate its value to the community. In the past, government has measured what it does and not necessarily what it achieves. Often government focuses on outputs, what activities, products or services it is providing and how much it costs to provide them. Just monitoring and reporting on outputs doesn't provide evidence of the impact of our work. Focusing on outcomes instead of outputs allows us to better identify what we want to achieve for Victoria. It connects our work with communities, <coughs> experts and service delivery sectors. It also provides flexibility and enables us to communicate what we want to achieve in a way that is meaningful for Victorians. What an interesting and refreshing approach from the Victorian Government. And indeed, in 2019, the Western Australian Government released its set of 12 key priorities in the Our Priorities Sharing Prosperity Program. It claims to set ambitions and accountable targets that will, and I quote, will require a sustained focus and in some cases the development of new and innovative approaches. Currently, the WA Government acknowledges that this program has been temporarily suspended in light of COVID as a priority focus. But ideally, what we would say, but ideally a meaningful policy progress framework would incorporate the necessary flexibility to be able to revise and adapt with the purposes of that revision and <coughs> learning important lessons. Oh, sorry, I've lost my place there. Good. Oh, I'm going to move on. Queensland. Let's talk about Queensland. They also have a Financial Accountability Act 2009, which requires that the government prepares and tables in its Legislative Assembly a statement of the government's broad objectives for the community. These priorities are also made publicly available on the government website, along with, along with an individual letter from the Premier to each minister outlining each minister's portfolio <coughs> priorities in accordance with those published government key priorities. They're referred to as the Premier's ministerial charter letters. It's expected then that the government provides regular status updates against those objectives that have been put forward as their accountable uh, priorities. In New South Wales, I was most interested to look at the model that they have there because it's quite a comprehensive one. In 2012, sorry, in 2015, there were 12 initial Premier's priorities launched by the New South Wales government. They were then subsequently updated to the current 14 announced in 2019. These four, 14 policy areas are designed to deliver on key transformational goals. And those goals are defined as this in New South Wales. A strong economy, 
highest quality education, well-connected communities with quality local environments, putting the customer at the centre of everything we do, breaking the cycle of disadvantage. But it's not just empty words making a list like that. The model there in New South Wales for each of the 14 policy priority areas actually lays out measurable baseline, interim, actual and target indicators that are reported on publicly and made available online. In New South Wales, there's a Premier's Implementation Unit, the PIU, that monitors and reports on progress with the input of the agencies responsible for delivering the specified targets. The Premier receives monthly progress updates and every six months, delivery reports are provided to the Premier and Cabinet. This priority focus, this approach, is now also reflected in the New South, New South Wales state budget process and papers, with the 2018-2019 budget papers outlining a shift. You love this, Madam Deputy President. Budget papers outlining a shift to outcome budgeting rather than the more reductionist output and particular line item spends focus. Significantly, the New South Wales Progress Policy Performance Model is independently auditable. In 2018, the New South Wales Auditor General conducted a progress and measurement of Premier's priorities performance audit on the initial 12 priorities, which made improvement recommendations. And also importantly, social change advocates, such as NCOS, have seen an improvement in policy delivery and accountability. And indeed, in speaking with them directly on this, I heard that groups like NCOS utilise those articulated priority areas to do the advocacy that they do on the social issues that are their priorities. It gives them a common language to talk with government, particularly when it comes to targets, when it comes to data collection and when it comes to making measurable progress. Madam Deputy President, while no system is completely perfect, and these New South Wales key goals and the 14 policy priority areas may not be the ones that would be relevant for, for us here in Tasmania. The point is that in other jurisdictions, substantial progress is being made and significant acknowledgement is given to the fact that you can't just make a list that you tick off of activity. You actually have to commit to delivering accountable outcomes. Those models from other areas, from other jurisdictions, demonstrate that it's possible to put in place models that can be evaluated and reported against, enabling a more transparent accountability mechanism, which the broader community, not just government, not just us here in Parliament, but the broader community and all stakeholders and policymakers can engage with. It's also worthwhile to quickly mention New Zealand in this benchmarking of real progress indicators that, we are, um, that I'm outlining here. Since 2019, New Zealand has released three annual wellbeing budgets. They are structured around collaboratively produced living standards framework, the LSF indicators. And the intent of these indicators is to underpin the goals from budget to budget to measure whether financial allocations translates into real improvements for people's daily lives. Let me just pause there and reiterate that. This is the government that is actually holding itself accountable to not just announce what they're spending and crow about it, but to measure and report on what real improvement in people's lives those investments are making. This shift to a wellbeing framework was announced by the New Zealand government in 2018. Significantly, when, it annou when announced, it was introduced as a framework and management tool, which would, and I quote here, it would assist the government in coordinating a cohesive government work program across portfolios. The approach seeks a more comprehensive and accurate representation of the issues New Zealanders are experiencing and that the government is responding to. It aims to provide a broader and more relevant measure of success. And further, it says this, at the centre of the government's approach is a desire to change the manner in which the government sets priorities, monitors progress and reports results. The approach seeks a more comprehensive and accurate representation of the issues New Zealanders are experiencing and that the government is responding to. The government's aim is to provide greater transparency across priority areas, what actions have been undertaken to achieve its goals and how they have resulted in change. This approach provides a more relevant and broader measure of success. Well, fancy that. We know this because part of the government's commitment, we, we know all this about New Zealand because part of that government's commitment to transparency is that it releases publicly cabinet papers 
actually within 30 days of Cabinet meetings, which outline all manner of things that have been dealt with in Cabinet, including this wellbeing approach and the recommendation that was made to Cabinet to adopt it. A transparency step in this manner would be wonderful to see with this Tasmanian Government. Uh, I'm not going to hold my breath on it, but we can all live in hope. <laughs> Following the 2019 release of the first wellbeing budget in New Zealand, the World Economic Forum, held in Davos, described that budget as groundbreaking and said that <coughs> New Zealand wants to transform its politics to focus on kindness, empathy and wellbeing. Who here, Madam Deputy President, would not agree that Tasmanians deserve a similar focus from its government and parliament? But such efforts need to extend beyond lip service and just dropping words like compassion into speeches. Words are empty without clear and accountable actions and measurable outcomes to back them up. There's a global push for a more purposeful capitalism, implementing new metrics. For example, The Guardian reported in 2019 that Lord Richard Layard, a program director at the London School of Economics and the vice chair of the UK all-party parliamentary group on wellbeing economics, also publicly called for wellbeing to replace growth as the main aim of UK spending. Madam Deputy President, <clears throat> as we know, this concept of community-developed community shared progress indicators and publicly reported updates on social measures is not entirely alien to Tasmanians. The community has previously embraced the notion of a transparent system of performance indicators in the format of the former Tasmania Together process, which intended to measure real progress of agreed priorities for the period of 2000 to 2020. <coughs> Unfortunately, despite the dedicated and hard work invested into that process, we saw it truncated earlier, early before its completion. And while it, while it was picked up and integrated across operations of some sectors, for example, local councils, we didn't see it become entrenched within or, or shape even the state budget process in a transformational outcome-focused manner that we're now seeing in New South Wales with their model and in New Zealand with theirs. However, one critical component of the TAS Together project, which I think is a strength, uh, is that the key priority areas that sat at the heart of that initiative were identified and driven by a comprehensive community consultation process. In contrast, many of the examples that I ran through from other jurisdictions reflected more of a political prioritisation process imposed from the top down by governments of the day to a large extent, rather than developed in a collaborative manner from the community up. I believe that should Tasmania move to catch up with these more modern, responsive and accountable outcome-oriented policy progress frameworks implemented elsewhere, we can actually become global leaders through incorporating that invaluable TAS Together experience by ensuring any identified key priority areas are developed in collaboration with the Tasmanian community. Wherever possible, we should avoid being limited to the top political priorities simply of the government of the day. Madam Deputy President, I, to reiterate, I believe that Tasmanians deserve to have this government invest in their immediate and long-term wellbeing within a transparent and accountable outcomes framework. Such a framework would deliver public confidence in a genuine commitment to achieving real progress on our entrenched challenges. In support of that, I further believe it's incumbent upon all of us elected representatives and legislators to assist with that transition, that transition of gut to governance that gauges and measures real long-term impact of government policies rather than short-term outputs. I invite other members here to give consideration to how we, in our valuable role, can more effectively establish an expectation on government to set, measure and report on progress towards important policy outcomes. I know most of us have areas of particular interest and attention in which we could readily contemplate outcomes measurements that would be meaningful when it comes to government accountability. I look forward to exploring this further. I think there is much we can do to assist with this task. And on that note, Madam Deputy President, I will conclude my remarks and note the address. The Honourable Member for Prosser and Minister for several things. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
Apparently the, the bell's lo um, lost its ding. It has. So I have a rise and it's ding. So it will be suspended until the ringing of the bells. Thank you.